We now turn to the use of the cosmic microwave background as a cosmological tool. This turns out to be the most powerful tool in our arsenal today, and it's what really led us into the era of precision cosmology. The basic idea is as follows. If we had something sufficiently large in the early universe that can be measured, and we knew what redshift it was, then we could apply angular diameter test to it and constrain cosmological parameters from that. And the largest possible thing we could think of would be the particle horizon at the time, which is the distance out to which causal connection can be established at the time that the universe was that old. If we can infer the size of the particle horizon from physical reasons, and if we can somehow find its signature in a microwave background, then we can perform the test. There will be density fluctuations in the early universe, and those are left over from the quantum fluctuations from even earlier times in the history of the universe. And they would manifest themselves as slight variations in density. You can decompose those in a series of waves overlapping, and the matter would fall towards the denser spots, and because the matter and radiation are tightly coupled before the micro background was released, radiation would follow inducing some slight Doppler shifts in its thermal emission. So when microwave background is released, the decoupling stops, and whatever pattern of fluctuation was there will remain frozen and observable today. Theory predicts that those who have amplitudes of some parts in million of the present day temperature, which is 2.7 degree Kelvin, and so be very, very subtle effect to measure. So for a long time, cosmologists tried to measure these fluctuations, and finally they succeeded. There have been many experiments leading towards this, but the first really successful one was a balloon-borne microwave background measurement from Antarctica called Boomerang. It was led by Andrew Lang and Paolo de Bernardis, uh, and they were the first ones to have convincing measurement of these fluctuations at the scales that are relevant here, and first ones to actually infer cosmological parameters from that. This was probably the single most important measurement at the time, at about the same time as the supernovae yielded evidence for dark energy, and together they really uh, opened this era of precision cosmology. Subsequently, a WMAP satellite, which is Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, was launched, and its purpose was to do this measurement even more precisely. And today, the best results we have come from analysis of the data from WMAP. So here is how this works. If you were to take an image of the cosmic microwave background, it'll be pretty uniform. And so you have to turn the contrast knob by a factor of a thousand. And then you see that there is a dipole due to the motion of the Milky Way relative to the microwave background. If we then subtract that back dipole and then turn the knob to even higher contrast, to a million, then we'll see uh, fluctuations in the sky, a lot of them associated with the Milky Way galaxy, the foreground emission from synchrotron and dust and so on. And after careful modeling, which is very difficult and very delicate, emission from the galaxy has to be removed. And what's left is a pattern of density fluctuations in the early universe that have cosmological origin. And that is the signal we're looking for. So here is an image which is from the boomerang measurement. It's a false color representation of temperature fluctuations on the sky. And you can see that they're characteristic size blobs. They turn out to be about one degree. So that is actually size of the particle horizon at the time of the coupling. So here again is how this works. In the early universe, there will be density fluctuations residual of quantum processes. Matter will be falling towards the densest parts. Radiation would follow and have slight Doppler shifts. This is why things are called Doppler peaks later. And when the coupling come, time comes, the pattern is frozen. If you now remember Fourier decomposition, any density field in any number of dimensions, whether it's a straight line, like normal acoustic signals, 
or three-dimensional field in density can be decomposed into set of overlapping waves. And the largest one of those is the largest wavelength that can be accommodated, which is the size of the particle horizon. The pattern will then stay imprinted on microwave background radiation after it's been decoupled from the matter. And by measuring it, we can infer things about the size of the horizon and expansion rate at the time it, uh, it was released. And it depends actually on all manner of cosmological parameters, which can be computed nicely from theory. The way we quantify this is through spherical harmonics, which is essentially an equivalent of Fourier decomposition on a sphere. Schematically, this is how it works. Just like in Fourier analysis, fluctuations of certain size would, leave, uh, would be represented as a peak in the power spectrum corresponding to that spatial wavelength. The big ones would have very low spatial frequency, the uh, small ones would have very high spatial frequency. Here is a simple mathematical simulation of this from Ned Wright, putting different numbers of waves on a sphere corresponding to a different wave number, which is called L. Mathematically, this is again equivalent to Fourier decomposition, but on a sphere. And instead of Fourier components, we are talking about spherical harmonics. And any signal on the surface of the sphere can be expressed as a sum of spherical harmonics weighted appropriately component by component, and formulas for each one of those exist and can be computed. So what's measured really is a combination of many different waves, but different wavelengths on the sphere have different weights, and their distribution will be the power spectrum. So again, this is completely equivalent to power spectra in Fourier analysis, except that now their waves are on the sphere and not online or in plane. So from the measurements, we can infer what the power spectrum is, and from that we can then infer something about initial density fluctuations. The characteristic size that corresponds to particle horizon at the time is given by the wave number is equal approximately 180 degrees divided by that spherical harmonic L. And if we can find out what that is, then we can say something about size and expansion rate of the universe at the time. So here, W map results, interim results, they got slightly better later as they kept re-reducing the data. And there is a very prominent and obvious peak at about L of 200, or angular scale a little less than one degree. And that corresponds to the size of the horizon. The other bumps you see are harmonics of the base frequency. So different cosmological models in different combinations of parameters make a prediction of a curve that will go through these data points. And shown here is a particularly well-fitting model that is a model that's now pretty much generally accepted. The exact positions and amplitudes and relative amplitudes and widths of these peaks depend, again, on complicated mixtures of cosmological parameters, total matter density, dark energy density, baryonic density, expansion rate, and so on. And in principle, could be used to constrain all of them. However, this is a very complex process, and analysis involves creating large ensembles of model universes and finding out which fit best and what are the, what are the likelihood distributions of each one of the parameters. So the first question was, what is the basic geometry of the universe? Is it open, closed, or just critical? And in fact, it turns out it was flat within the measurement errors. That initial measurement said that omega total is within one sigma away from unity. So even the original measurement implied that the universe is flat within measurement errors, which are of the order of a couple percent. Since then, those got even more precise. That in itself is a very important result, that the universe is spatially flat. But remember, it, that can be achieved as a many different combinations of the density of matter and density of vacuum energy or cosmological constant. So by itself, this measurement doesn't tell you much about the dark energy. But combined with others, 
it can be used as a very powerful constraint. So, for example, if we can deduce from dynamical measurements that omega of matter is about 0.3, then this immediately implies that the omega of the dark energy is about 0.7. Or if we can combine it with another measurement, like that one of supernovae, that will do the same thing. It's important to note that since so many parameters are mixed together in producing these patterns of density fluctuations, there, there is some degeneracy, uh, which means essentially that a lot of them will be coupled together. And in this particular case, the error ellipses are highly elongated along the line that's almost parallel to the flat universe line in the old diagram of omega matter versus omega vacuum, which is why we think the universe is very close to flat. So that degeneracy can be broken by a different measurement, which would have error ellipses that are not oriented in the same way. And you may recall that those from supernova measurements look pretty much orthogonal to this. Another important measurement comes out of this is how many baryons are there in the universe. The more matter there is, stronger fluctuations, and therefore the amplitudes of the peaks will be higher. So here are examples of two models with different amounts of baryonic matter. And by fitting to the actual data, we can infer omega baryons. And the result is shown here, expressed in units of little h, which is Hubble constant units of 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Since we know that little h is roughly 0.7, then this really means that omega baryons is about 4.5%. And this is in a remarkably good agreement with the measurement from cosmic nucleosynthesis that we will come to later which is a completely independent, assumes different physics, different measurements, and different everything, which is why we believe that this result is probably correct. Because when you have different methods leading to the same result, then that gives it much more credence. So the question then arises, all right, if there were these characteristic fluctuations at the time of decoupling, will they be observable later on? And the answer is yes. There will be corresponding imprint on a very large-scale structure in the universe, which could be observable in principle in clustering of galaxies at comparable scales, which are roughly 120 megaparsecs for little h of 1, or a little shy of 200 megaparsecs for realistic values of Hubble constant. Hints of this were seen first in Redshift survey uh, of, from Australia, the 2DF, Redshift survey, which we'll address later, and then confirmed with Sloan Digital Sky Survey, there is a slight excess of power in clustering of galaxies on the scales that correspond now to that first Doppler peak, except this is much later in the history of the universe. So the same standard ruler is now observed at different redshifts, and that makes the test far more powerful. Essentially, what that means is the error ellipses now rotate. And from multiple measurements, you can deduce a lot about geometry, even without re resort to the other uh, measurements like supernovae. Now, there are many efforts aimed to do precisely this, to observe the slight excess of clustering corresponding to the first Doppler peak in microwave background at the range of redshifts. And that can constrain cosmological parameters even better. Here is a table from some of the cosmological parameters, many of which we haven't introduced yet, having to do with structure formation, just as an illustration of the precision that was obtained from WMAP. It actually got even better. Uh, this was after three years of data. And now we have final results that are after nine years of data, which are very slightly different and more precise. Even better data are coming. ESA has a satellite called Planck, which is essentially like WMAP with even a higher precision. And we expect to see results from that within a year or thereabouts. Next time, we will address source counts as a cosmological test.